Okay. Uh, today, it is our great greatest honor to have uh, Professor Nati Seiberg from Institute for Advanced Study. He will be telling us continuum quantum field theory for fracton uh, part one. And uh, we would like to welcome uh, Nati uh, very cordially and warmly to uh, Harvard uh, CMSA seminar. They are Kavo, Shalanu, Bona Kavel, Iwaka, and Professor Nathan Cyber, Toda Lava, Ika, Anna Takishu, Baba Yet. And thank you, Nati, for accepting uh, to speak today. There will be a part two of talk on fracton. Uh, given by uh, Su Han Sao tomorrow at, at the same time, so you can stay tuned. So let's welcome Nati. Thank you, Juven, for the invitation. It's a great honor and pleasure to give this talk. As you can see, this is part one, and part two will be given tomorrow. And Shu Han and I coordinated the two talks, and they are arranged such that every talk is self-contained, and, but also, if you want a better understanding of what's going on, you should really hear both of them. But if you didn't understand something in this talk or you find, found it uninteresting, don't worry, it will be better tomorrow. So I'll talk mostly about, there's a four, paper, four related papers that I wrote the first one, which was kind of a precursor of these developments in September. And three papers we put uh, within a month in this talk, I'll talk mostly about the first one, and I will do it in some, some level of detail. But the more interesting results are actually in the third paper, which will be discussed tomorrow by Shu Hank. So if you want a superficial understanding of the topic, this is a good time to leave the seminar and come back tomorrow. If you want to understand it in more detail, then you should really go through all these uh, papers. So since we have 90 minutes, uh, first of all, I'd like to encourage you to interrupt me with questions. It's plenty of time. But I'd also like to start with a rather long introduction because we have people here from different fields and different backgrounds and their perspective on some of the notions that I'll discuss are a little bit different. So I wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page. So I'll start with some introduction about quantum field theory. We assume that we started short distances with some model, which could be a lattice model or what have you, with some local interactions. And the law is that once this is the case, at long distances, we can describe the physics by a continuum quantum field theory. This law has been enormously powerful over the last several decades. And there are several reasons to like this law. And there are also some pragmatic reasons it is good because the quantum field theory captures the universal aspects of the short distance model. The short distance model depends on, in fact, infinite number of parameters, whereas the continuum limit or the long distance continuum field theory depends only on a finite number of parameters. So it's a much more effective way to describe the, the long distance behavior of the system. So we shouldn't celebrate too much because models of fractons are notable counterexamples. And they've been popular over the last several years. This is a relatively recent development. And they appear that they do not fit into this framework of continuum quantum field theory. They appear like no continuum quantum field theory can describe fractons. And I view that challenging for various reasons. Some of them I'll explain. I will also review soon why fractons are so special and one might think that they are counterexamples. So our goal today will be to slightly extend the framework of continuum quantum field theory to accommodate fractons and other models. And we shouldn't extend it too much because if we extend it too much, we'll just throw the baby with the bathtub water. Instead, we'd like to make a slight extension of what we normally do in continuum quantum field theory such that we can capture these systems. So there are really two totally distinct motivations for this, uh, for this work. One is to find a universal description of fractals. So there are many fractal models in the literature. There isn't a good way to, as far as I know, to organize them. And maybe find fitting them in the language of continuum field theory would be a good way to shed light on the fractal models and to give an effective description of them. 
The second motivation, which is not less important, is that quantum field theory appears everywhere, and we should really explore quantum field theory just for the sake of exploring quantum field theory. And hopefully this will teach us something about quantum field theory. So let me summarize some of the features of fractals which they make them so interesting and so puzzling and challenging. So there are many examples and it's hard to give a, a complete characterization of all of them, but let me mention some of their features that are interesting. So the first thing is some of the gap models have particles of restricted mobility. So these are particles like excitations that are restricted to be at a point or to move on a line or to move on a plane. This is already quite bizarre. The second thing appears even more challenging for quantum field theory. There's an infinite ground state degeneracy in the continuum limit. So let me define the continuum limit. We have some lattice model with lattice spacing A with the number say we have periodic boundary conditions and we have big Li, L, big Li is an integer, is the number of sites in the I direction. And the length of the system is Li times A. And the continuum limit is defined holding the physical size fixed and sending little a to zero. So that we have a, a continuous chunk of material with fixed size. And the log of the number of ground states in some of these models is linear in these integers. And this is peculiar for many reasons. First of all, it's not extensive. It's proportional to the length rather than the volume. Second, it keeps growing as we make the size bigger. But what's perhaps most puzzling is that it is infinite in the continuum limit. So just by looking at this formula, if A goes to zero, big L I goes to infinity. So we have an infinite ground state degeneracy. Quantum field theory, standard continuum quantum field theory cannot accommodate. The next surprising aspect is that they exhibit some exotic global symmetries and I'll discuss them in detail. Some of these developments came from the quantum information community and there they're called logical operators since I think that most of the people in the audience here are physicists, so we'll just refer to them as symmetries. If we just look at all these features together, we'll learn something quite surprising. The fact that we have a ground, the ground state degeneracy depends on the number of sites on the lattice means that the long distance physics depends on high momentum modes. In high energy physics, this is known as UVIR mixing. In quantum field, standard quantum field theories do not exhibit UVIR mixing. What we see here is that if we go to very, very low energies with a very big lattice and the lattice spacing is tiny, the features of the low energy physics depend crucially on phenomena at arbitrarily high momentum. So this is something that is really challenging for, high, for continuum field theory and it really reflects these two aspects of uh, the fractal models. So as is clear from this, this is impossible in standard continuum field theory. And it seems to contradict the renormalization group picture. The renormalization group picture states that as we go to low energies, most of the details of the short distance physics are gone. And in fact, we are sensitive only to a small number of properties of the low energy physics, small number of parameters. And here we have sensitivity to high energy modes. So it's clear that something will have to give. There's no way to fit that in standard quantum field theory. So let me first give you a one slide summary of what the new elements that we will use. And I emphasize that these elements are essentially unavoidable. Just by looking at the answers that we would like to reproduce, these properties of these lattice systems, if we try to fit them in, into a continuum framework, we have no choice and these are the absolute minimum things we'll need to do. The first thing is the space-time symmetries. We clearly don't have Lorentz invariance. This is completely standard in condensed matter physics. Also, we do not have rotation symmetry. We are going to preserve only the subgroup of rotations generated by 90 degree rotations. This is also relatively standard in, con in condensed matter physics. High energy physicists like Lorentz invariant systems. This system is not Lorentz invariant. It's not even rotation invariant. So that's not a big deal. We are also going to impose some exotic global symmetries and then we'll gauge them. And I'll say quite a lot about what I mean by global symmetry and what I mean by gauging later 
So let's postpone that. But the symmetries will clearly not be standard symmetries that are often imposed on continuum field theories. But what I think is the most interesting and most surprising thing, which again I emphasize is unavoidable, is that although our space will be continuous, we'll be forced to continue to consider discontinuous fields living on our space. Now on the lattice, everything is discontinuous. If we think of the lattice as being an approximation of some continuous space, then the field has independent values at different, value, at different points in space. And since it has different values at different points in space, the field is obviously discontinuous. In the other extreme, in standard continuum quantum field theory, the fields are smooth. We think that we have continuous maps from space time to some target space, and then we analyze these maps. What we'll see here is that we have something in between. The fields will not be as discontinuous as in on the lattice, but on the other hand, they will be not as continuous as in the continuum. And I will be very, very explicit about it. We'll also study gauge theories. And when we have gauge theories, this complication with discontinuous fields will get into the gauge parameters. So we will consider gauge theories whose gauge transformation parameters can be discontinuous. And if the gauge parameter can be discontinuous, transition functions can also be discontinuous. And we'll see that in examples later. We'll consider gauge theories. They will have twisted boundary conditions. There will be quantized fluxes but everything will be done with fields which have discontinuities with very prescribed and very limited kinds of uh, discontinuities. But the key thing that we will emphasize on is this property, that it's universal. So whatever we find will be independent of the details of the lattice on the lattice, uh, the lattice scale. In fact, all the examples that we will study will be interacting complicated systems on the lattice but the continuum long distance behavior will be given by free field theories. So this is an enormous simplification. We have a continuum description with terms of free fields with a small number of parameters. And this description captures all the long distance behavior of the short distance theory. So this might sound too strong. So let me immediately qualify this advertisement. We do not have a general systematic presentations of all such theories. And our understanding is incomplete. And throughout the talk, and especially at the end, I will, uh, I will highlight the points that I really feel need much better understanding. Instead of having a systematic presentation of such theories, we decided to explore specific examples. So what we'll do in this talk, I will consider only three examples all of them are not new. These are lattice models that have been studied in a lot of detail in, by various people. And I'll give some references. And what we did was to force these lattice systems into a continuum description. So we're not making any broad statement that we know how to extend quantum field theory with such a, a discontinuous fields. All we'll say is that it works well in these examples. And I think it's worth exploring other examples. So in the three papers that I mentioned, we studied 11 different continuum models. Some of them turned out to be dual to each other. That's already kind of nice that we perform duality transformations and we land on another model of the same kind. So that altogether there were six distinct models. In this talk, we'll discuss only a few of them and which are actually a little bit easier and tomorrow, Shu Han will describe others, which are the more exciting ones, the ones that have a more interesting behavior. So I mentioned global symmetries. And over the last few years, I've interacted with people in different communities, different condensed matter physicists, and different communities in condensed matter physics, different communities in high energy physics. And people have different views on the role of global symmetry. So I thought I would spend a slide or two discussing what we mean by global symmetry and why it is so important here. So the framework is, as I said before, we started short distances with some Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, for example, some lattice model. And it has some global symmetry, which we'll call G U V, G equal group and U V because it's at short distances. We might also, might or might not have some gate symmetry at short distances. This is not going to be essential for us because the notion of the gate symmetry is anyway ambiguous. 
Now, from the high energy point of view, we get the notion of natura naturalness, natural, natural. So the short distance theory, the, the global symmetry that we impose GUV could be as complicated or as crazy as you want, but we insist that all the terms in the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian that are compatible with that symmetry appear with coefficients of order one. This is naturalness and all the models we'll discuss will very religiously stick to this notion. All our models will be natural in that sense. And this is something that is common in high energy physics. We'll soon come to something which is common in condensed matter physics. Now, our goal is always to start from the UV and ask what happens at long distances. So at long distances, we have another symmetry group, another global symmetry group, GIR, and it includes some of the elements of the UV, the short distance group. Some of the group, some of the elements at short distances of the short distance group might not act at long distances. There might also be new elements that act at long distances, but not at short distances. And they come under the name of accidental symmetries or emergent symmetries. And there might also be some emergent gate symmetry, but again, this will play no role in this talk. But now comes the crucial aspect. Given the UV theory and its global symmetry, and we have some emergent theory at long distances, the crucial thing we should understand is whether this behavior at long distances is robust. I do not know whether this term had appeared earlier before, so I'll give a definition of robust, although the notion clearly is well understood. So what we should do is we should look at the long distance behavior and look for the lowest dimension operator that can cause the theory not to be robust. So we look for an operator that preserves the UV symmetry, but violates the infrared symmetry. And the infrared theory in GIR is robust if and only if this operator is irrelevant. So we have lots of examples of that. In fact, every model is an example. We look at the XY model, for very long distances, it's robust because the winding mode is irrelevant below the costelic starless points. This is the XY model in one plus one dimensions. Below the costelic starless radius, the UV symmetry is still just the momentum symmetry. The winding symmetry is no longer robust because the winding symmetry, the winding operator is relevant and it destabilizes the system. So a special case is a case where there's no such operator. We could also ask a bigger question of what happens if we perturb the UV system and, and violate the ultraviolet symmetry. We preserve a subgroup of it, that subgroup might be empty. Again, we analyze it the same way. We should find the lowest dimension operator in the long distance theory that preserves the UV symmetry that we want to preserve, but violates this one. And the system is, if and, is robust, if and only if this operator is irrelevant. This is very important because when I talk with many, say, condensed matter people, they would tell me, at short distances, we don't have any of these elaborate symmetries. So why should we be interested in systems which have this elaborate symmetry? And the I, question is, is completely valid. And the way I would phrase it is that we are interested in the symmetry, in the system with the global symmetry, because it's interesting in its own right. But after we are done doing that, we should also explore with whether it is robust. So even if in practice we do not have an elaborate symmetry, it is still interesting to analyze models that have that global symmetry. And as I said, it is interesting in its own right. It's also interesting that once we have the symmetry, we can solve the model, we can analyze it. And then once we analyze it, we can tell whether the system is robust or not. So we could use the global symmetry to control our system. Then we go to long distances. And once we are at long distances, we could check what are the operators that can destabilize the system. And if there aren't any, then even though this global symmetry that we started with might look exotic or very peculiar or does not appear in nature, it doesn't matter because the long distance behavior that we find is robust and is not going to change under small deformations of the UV system. We can even extend this notion a little bit. And even if the system is not robust, sometimes there are only a few relevant operators that can destabilize it. And then we can tolerate some small amount of fine tuning. We can tolerate some small amount of fine tuning and still find the system that we want. 
Now, this discussion might sound very abstract and very general, but I want to emphasize that almost every system we know behaves this way. And we'll also see examples below. So an example of a system which is not robust is something that high energy physicists love to study is this boson on a circle in one plus one dimensions below the cost of its solid radius or a QED or just U1 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions, excluding the monopole operators. So these systems are not robust, but we'll see examples of that later. So moving to the talk, I will have three classes of models. In fact, in this talk, I'll have three models. We'll start with the scalar field theory phi, which has a global U1 symmetry, but it would be a very exotic U1 symmetry. We'll analyze it in a lot of detail. We'll find the conserved currents. We'll work out the spectrum and find the operators, etc. And we'll explore its robustness. Then we'll gauge this symmetry and study a gauge theory with the same global, or taking the global symmetry and making it into a gauge symmetry. We'll study the pure gauge theory. And again, we'll go through the same steps. Then we'll couple the U1 gauge theory to another system to Higgs it to, uh, to Zn. And this would be a way to explore the Zn gauge theory. So the talk will have three parts. Part one will study the scalar field theory. Part two will start, study the U1 gauge theory. And part three will study the Zn gauge theory. And tomorrow, Shu Heng will follow exactly the same logic of this three step. We'll have a model of scalars, the U1 gauge theory, and then the ZN gauge theory. And we'll see how it connects to various models that exist in the literature. Almost, perhaps almost all, if not all, the models that will be discussed both today and tomorrow are models that exist in the literature. They're not new, they have been analyzed in a lot of detail by other people. And our goal here is not to analyze the model, but just to fit them into this framework of continuum field theory. So let us start with this model, which is actually not a model of fractals. It first appeared in this paper, and we can call it the XY plaquette lattice model in two plus one dimensions. And the reason for the name will be clear soon. So we have a two-dimensional spatial lattice. We put phases e to the i phi s, s, lab, s here labels the sites, and conjugate momenta p s at the sites. And the Hamiltonian and isopress coefficient is sum of momentum square and sum of the plaquettes, cosine phi plaquettes. A phi plaquette is the oriented sum of these phi's around the plaquettes. And we exclude, unlike the standard XY model, we exclude nearest neighbor couplings. So we do not have the standard nearest neighbor couplings in the, uh, that appears in the ordinary XY model. And we also exclude more generic next to nearest neighbor coupling. So a high energy physicist would immediately ask, if you excluded some couplings, is it natural? And the answer is yes, it is natural because this system has what is called a subsystem symmetry which I'll explain soon. I should just emphasize because when I gave the talk before people complained that subsystem symmetries, I gave reference to these people, but in fact, subsystem symmetries had appeared earlier in other papers. So regardless of who was the first here, this is how it acts. We can pick one value of x, x zero, and shift phi for every y by the same phase. That's clearly a symmetry of this Hamiltonian because every plaquette here has two phi's with the same x, but they come in opposite signs. And therefore, this transformation keeps the Hamiltonian invariant. So we take one, lab, one say, one row of, of spins, and we rotate all of them by the same amount without touching the fields in the other rows. So this is the global symmetry, and we can do the same thing with y. We can describe this global symmetry differently. I, here I just copied what we had on the previous slide. We can take the phi, x and y here are discrete variables. They, are the, they label the points on the lattice. And we can shift phi at the point x, y by, by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. So this is an enormously big symmetry. In fact, since everything is discrete, how many elements do we have? We have Lx sites in the x direction and ly sites in the y direction. And therefore we have 
arbitrary in arbitrary parameter continuous parameter here and arbitrary continuous parameter here so that's lx plus ly but the zero mode is shared between them so altogether the symmetry group is lx is u1 to a power lx plus ly minus one so this is an enormous global symmetry so this is a well-defined model. It's an interacting model because it's like the XY model. And we are going to discuss it in some continuum limit and see how its behavior in the continuum is different than an ordinary field theory. So we're going to take the continuum limit and we're going to take the coefficient in front of the cosine to be very large. The coefficient in front of the cosine is very large then the argument of the cosine phi plaquette must be much less than one. And this is the oriented sum of the phi's around the plaquette. So this is the double derivative of phi with lattice spacing a squared here, much be less than one. So if we just expand the Hamiltonian or the Lagrangian, the system that we have is this continuum system in two plus one dimensions. There's a kinetic term, d0 phi squared minus some, you know, some quote unquote potential dx dy phi quantity square and phi is a circle value or we call it compact. From this moment on we have a free field theory and as I like to say since the theory is free we have no excuse not to understand it. We must understand what this system does and we'll just follow our nose and do what we normally do in continuum field theory. This is the system which we just analyze it. So the first thing to do is to look at the equation of motion. This is the equation of motion. And again, I emphasize, I suppress coefficients here and here, both dimension less and dimension full coefficients. They're not important and I drop them in order not to clutter the slides. So we have this equation of motion and we substitute the plane wave solution and we find the dispersion relation that omega squared from here is px squared py squared from here. So for generic, so this is a very peculiar dispersion relation. But the key point that I would like to emphasize is that if a py vanishes, then P, a px can be arbitrarily large and omega is still zero. And similarly, if py vanish, if px vanishes and py can be arbitrarily large and omega is zero. This is the UVIR mixing. So this is, the, this is really the, the key point. The key point is that when we go to low momentum in X, we are sensitive to what happens at arbitrary high momentum in Y and vice versa. And I'll say more about that below. Please interrupt me with questions because otherwise I'll just continue without any feedback. Okay. So we should describe that in terms of a symmetry. So this was the equation of motion and we can view this equation of motion is associated with a net of current. So this is the net of conservation. So J0 is D0 phi and JXY is DX DY phi from here. And now we can, so this is, the, this is just the conserved current. And once we have the conserved currents, we can find the conserved charges. So we integrate the current along Y or we can integrate a the current along, I see there's a question. Yeah, I want to ask uh, that you surprised the dimension for coefficient C. What's this uh, scale of this uh, dimensional, dimensional for parameter, the scale? Well, you can absorb it in X and Y. In this particular case, you can actually rescale X, Y, and T and set them to one. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. But in general, you cannot. But in this particular case, you can just rescale what you mean by x, y by one parameter and t by another and set all the coefficients to one. Yeah, which means it's not observable. It is observable because if you put it in finite volume, then there's the length of the system. So, oh, okay, okay, got it. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. So we have conserved charges. So we integrate dy or we integrate dx. And this is a conserved charge for every x and this is a conserved charge for every y. And the zero, they share the same zero mode. Because if we integrate this thing also over X and we integrate this over Y, we clearly get the same thing, which we call Q. So the zero mode Q implements the standard what in high energy physics called momentum symmetry that shifts phi by a constant. And QX and QY, the position dependent ones, 
are nothing but the symmetries we discussed earlier, the subsystem symmetries, except that here they are phrased in continuum notation. Let's see how it works on the fields. So now we are in, in the continuum. So we have a continuum field phi x, y, and t. It is mapped to phi x, y, and t plus an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. And here I really emphasize that this function of x and this function of y could be discontinuous. And with discontinuous, I do not just mean that they can have kinks, the, the, fun the function could be completely erratic. For simplicity, let's think of it as being piecewise continuous with a finite number of jumps. And it's straightforward to check that this is indeed the global symmetry of this Lagrangian. If you substitute such a shift here, here the time derivative kills this thing. And here, even if x is the x dependent is discontinuous, the dx dy things kill it. So this is a good symmetry of this system. Since we have a free theory, the next thing to do is to check the spectrum of the system. So we recall that this was our dispersion relation. And for generic, for every px and py, we have a mode and we can quantize it. And for generic px and py, we have nothing but the standard Fox space. The relation between energy and momentum, momentum in x and momentum in y is peculiar, but other than that, it's essentially as in standard free field theory. But the modes with omega equals zero are much more interesting. So for px equals zero, for py equals zero, omega is zero. And the corresponding field configuration looks like that. Phi, our field is a smooth function of x and y and t, but we are allowed to add to it this mode with px equals zero, py equals zero, the function of x and t, which is discontinuous in x, and the function f of y and t, which is discontinuous in y. And taking such functions and plugging them into the action shows that the action is still finite. So there's nothing to stop us from considering such functions. In fact, we must consider such functions. The act, when we sum of the all configurations in the functional integral, we must consider such functions, which are uh, discontinuous. In fact, recall the momentum symmetry that we had, the shifts phi by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. This was our global symmetry. So we see that phi under that global symmetry transforms inhomogeneously under that global symmetry, shift the x and shift the y. And therefore we could think of these discontinuous functions that appear here, those associated with modes with either px or py equals zero. So these modes have py equals zero and these modes have px equals zero. We can think of these modes as being the Goldstone modes associated with the spontaneous breaking of this uh, momentum symmetry. We will soon see that this interpretation is not correct. But at this at least classical level, we had a Lagrangian which had a symmetry. It was this shift symmetry, this crazy shift symmetry that depends on x or on y. This symmetry appears to be spontaneously broken. And because of that, we have all these modes. We had an infinite symmetry, and therefore we have an infinite number of Goldstone, of Goldstone modes. Let's quantize these modes. So we just take this function and we substitute it in the Lagrangian. Since the zero modes of these two functions are tied together, more care is needed. This is done in the paper, but for simplicity, let's ignore it here. So we take such a field configuration and we substitute it into the Lagrangian and we get a factor, factor of ly, the length of y, because this thing is independent of y. So the y in the world is easy. So the system becomes effectively a one plus one dimensional system because we have a mo the field depends only on x and t. But the second peculiarity is that this one, in this one plus one dimensional system, we do not have any x derivative. In fact, that's why this f of x would have been discontinuous. So this is a very special Lagrangian. So it's special in two ways. First, instead of being two plus one dimensional, it's only one plus one dimensional. And second, it does not have the x derivative and which is why these functions can be discontinuous. So for every value of x, we have a rotor. So this is a quantum mechanical system that I really like. F is compact, it's periodic. F is identified with f plus two pi. And this is nothing but the velocity square of that rotor. So we have such a rotor for each x. So just to think about it, but it's not essential, but just to think about it, let's put it on a lattice. And I emphasize this is not the original two-dimensional lattice. 
This is the lattice I introduced only in order to analyze this one plus one dimensional system. So if I put it on the lattice, this is the X gives me a factor of the lattice spacing and the interval becomes a sum. And we have a number of rollers labeled by X. Now it's a finite number of rollers labeled by X. And we have the lattice spacing here. The rotor is two pi periodic. So the energy of the rotor is given by momentum square. And this coefficient goes into the, to the denominator. So here we really diagonalize the Hamiltonian. For every point in X, we have an integer. The integers don't have to be continuous. In fact, integers cannot be continuous unless they are the same. But so for every X, we have an integer. But the energy of this mode is of order one over a. So this is the formula for the energy. And we see that in the continuum limit, all these states have very high energy. So we said that these modes started their lives as the goldstone modes of a spontaneously broken global symmetry. Now we see that in the quantum theory, not only is the symmetry restored, in fact, all these momentum modes, all the charged states under that global symmetry have energy of order one over A, so have infinite energy. So we are used to the fact that in one plus one dimensions, the symmetry appears to be spontaneously broken classically, but it is restored in the quantum theory. Here it's much more dramatic. Not only is the symmetry restored, all the charged states have infinite energy. So that's what I said here. So what should we make out of these modes? So we have these momentum modes, these charged states, states charged under the global symmetry, and they have infinite energy. What, how should we interpret them? So we have two interpretations, and one can take his or her favorite one. The more conservative approach is to say that all these modes have energy of order one over A. We're taking the continuum limit where A goes to zero. Therefore, all these states completely disappear from the low energy theory. We are left at low energies with no charged states under this global symmetry. That's the more conservative approach. A more ambitious and more interesting approach is to take this mode seriously and say, we did some calculation in the continuum theory and we found these states. These states are the lowest energy states charged under our global symmetry. And therefore we should take them seriously. In fact, if you perturb the continuum Lagrangian that we studied and ask, how does the, how does the behavior of the, such a mode change? We see that it doesn't change, it's universal. So we find a universal description of these states which carry charge, the state plus its small fluctuations around it are captured completely by the continuum Lagrangian that we wrote. In fact, you can go back to the original lattice system and we derive all these results on the lattice as a check that what we're saying here about the use of the continuum Lagrangian is true. Again, I want to emphasize that this is our goal here. Our goal is to take the, the lattice system, find a continuum description of it, and learning how to work with this continuum, with this, with this continuum field theory. So these are momentum modes, and anybody who spent any time in conformal field theory in one plus one dimensions know that the first, next thing to check is if there are winding modes. And in fact, the same conservation equation that we had, this was the conservation for the momentum mode, shows that there is also a winding mode. So we can swap jxy and j0 and find another conservation equation. This follows just from the property of derivative, d by dxy of this is the same as d by d0 of that. So we have a winding symmetry and this is, this is the letter current. This is a conserved current of our field theory. And we have conserved charges. We can integrate this over Y. Or we can integrate the, the time component of the current over X. And the zero modes are the same. Notice that this is exactly the same structure we had for the momentum modes. It's a charge for every X, a charge for every Y, and their zero modes are the same. What are the charge states? We should find configurations of phi that give us charge because we have a formula for the charge. It's easy to check that such a configuration is an interesting configuration and it gives charge. So let me guide you through that. Theta here is the heavy side theta function. So I pull this function out of a hat, and, but it 
just if we just check what we want it to do, we'll see that this is essentially the unique function. So we, it satisfies periodic boundary conditions by shifting x by the length lx. If you shift l by lx, this thing is shifted by theta of theta of y minus y zero. It's this term, and the shift from here cancels. And if we shift y by ly, again we get only a contribution from here. And since phi is circle valued. It means that such a configuration is a periodic configuration on our torus. So this is a good configuration uh, to study. And if you substitute it into the formula of the charges, you find that it carries charge, delta function charge at x0 and delta function charge at y0. This configuration will come again and again in this talk and also in Shu Heng's talk tomorrow. So that's why I emphasize it here. So this configuration is discontinuous because of the heavy side theta function. And, but in fact, unlike the configurations we studied before, the action of this configuration is infinite. And if we think of a state associated with this configuration, its energy is infinite. And the reason is that we have such a term in the Lagrangian and into, if we differentiate here with respect to dx dy, we get a delta function from here and a delta function from here. When we square it, we get delta of zero, or if we put it on the lattice, we get one over eight. So such configurations have energy, a lead to states with energy of order one over eight. And, but these are the lowest winding modes of the system. So how should we- uh, Nani, could you go back to the previous slide? And I just was, didn't quite get that. So just checking the X shifts by X plus LX. Okay, so if you shift x by lx. So, yeah, it's the last two terms. Why are they canceled? Because theta jumps by one, and from here we get another one, and they exactly cancel. Why, do, why does theta jump by one? Doesn't it depend on, I mean, why can't x be greater than x naught and x plus lx be greater than x naught? But you shift it by lx. So if you start within the fundamental domain. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that's, that's what you didn't say. So this. Yeah, you, have to, you have to do it a little bit more carefully, but when you do that, you will see that whatever shift you get from here is canceled by that. Okay, I thought you were on the universal cover and that's yeah. making sense. So how should we interpret these winding modes? And again, we have two interpretations which mirror the two options we had before. The more conservative approach would say that these winding modes have a infinite action and the corresponding states have infinite energy in the continuum limit. And therefore there's no reason to discuss them end of story. But we also have the more interesting and more ambitious approach. You say that on the lattice, the original two-dimensional lattice had momentum symmetry, but didn't have a winding symmetry. But you could check at what energy scale the winding symmetry is violated. And the winding symmetry on the lattice is violated at energy of order one over A squared. And although these states have energy of order one over A, they are still much, much lower energy then the energy with the winding symmetry is on the lattice is violated. And therefore, the symmetry is still valid at this energy. Furthermore, these are the lowest lying states carrying the charge. And therefore, the computation of their energy and small and computation of small deformations of this configuration are captured universally by our Lagrangian. So, the, we have these two interpretations. So notice that they mirror the two interpretations we had before. So it really begs the question of what kind of singularities we allow and why do we allow them and what are really the rules here? So let's go back to the two dimensional lattice. On the lattice, we have two pi periodicity at every site. And okay. pi at the site is not well defined. It's well what? defined up to two pi shift. In the continuum limit, we saw that the plaquettes, these combinations might be less than one. So phi, even though phi s is not well-defined, phi plaquette is well-defined. So I'll come to you with a question at the end of the slide. So phi itself at the site is not small. It can, it can jump by two pi. It has a two pi ambiguity, and therefore it's not a well-defined operator e to the i phi is well-defined on, on the lattice and on, in the continuum. And therefore, e to the i phi is a good operator, but phi is not a good operator. This is completely standard. That's what we do in every free boson. 
Here we have something new, dx d phi and dx square phi, etc., are not necessarily small. Only dx dy phi has to be small. The, sorry, only phi plaquette has to be small. And then for dx dy phi should be meaningful. But dx of dx square is not, not necessarily small. It suffers from two pi ambiguity. And therefore, unlike the standard compact scalar field, these are not good operators in our system. Phi is not good, e to the i phi is good, and this operator is not good. What about the double derivative? The double derivative is well-defined because, because of this equation. And since it's well-defined, when phi plaquette is much less than one, it doesn't suffer from the ambiguity. If phi plaquette is of order a square, then the x dy is finite. These are the configurations that lead to finite action configuration. If phi plaquette is order a, it is still much less than one, and therefore it's meaningful. And therefore, d phi, dx dy phi could be of order one over a and still be meaningful. In other words, in continuum language, we can have a single delta function of x times an arbitrary function of y, or a single delta function of y with an arbitrary function of x, but no double delta function. So there was a question. Yes, uh, I was just about to ask why in the previous slide you said the violation of the widening symmetries of order one over a squared. Uh, for that, you need to take a configuration that tries to violate the winding symmetry on the lattice and go carefully through the and go carefully through the the energetics. Uh -huh. So I don't see a clear thing, but you can basically see it because you have to unwrap the winding and you're going to pay the same a square. You need to make phi plaquette much bigger. It's the same statement as here. Uh -huh. If uh -huh. phi plaquette is everywhere small, then not the x dy phi, but phi plaquette. We have an a square here. In ordinary xy model, we have a dx phi. Here we have a squared dx dy phi. That's why we have this more option. Uh -huh. uh, I'd so like to state this fact as a gauge symmetry. That might be a little bit more technical, but I think it actually- uh, Nadi, before you do that, I have a question. Yes. Um, it's kind of a philosophical question about the discontinuous fields, but maybe now is a good time to ask it. So there are other models of fractons where people consider stacks of field theories. Yes. And Maybe you could try and contrast the, to, to what extent is having a stack of field theories different than allowing discontinuous fields? Ah, because I work, everything would be in the continuum. I'm going to have continuous symmetry. I'm going to have continuous shift symmetry in space. All my formulas are going to end up with, I have complete continuous, I have shift symmetry in space. Ordinary momentum of space is a good symmetry. I don't but have for an instance, underlying when you lattice. when you said you wanted to make sense of these charged operators, you reintroduced a lattice. I introduced it temporarily, but in the end, it wasn't there. But can you can you describe how you would make sense of those charged things keeping translation invariants? I, I will have another state where this guy is translated. For every configuration, I have an n of x. It's a function of x. It's an integer valued function of x and you can shift it by epsilon and you get n of x plus epsilon and you can do it for any epsilon. So I do have the complete translation symmetry. Even when you try to make sense of the things with energy of order one over a? That's correct. I have an infinite number of them and it's continuous. I can shift them from one point to the other. Okay, thank you. And I really like to, okay. So I'd like to phrase this business of what's meaningful and what's not meaningful, and we'll also shed some light on a, this discussion of the, the space of fields that we study. I'd like to propose it, to discuss it as a gauge principle. It's a little bit more technical, but I think it helps. So on the lattice, we can identify phi by two pi times an arbitrary function of x and y arbitrary integer functions of x and y. So at every x and y, we have an arbitrary identification by z, which we can say that we have a z gauge symmetry. In standard compact boson, we only gauge the zero mode because phi is continuous and w has to be, phi is continuous, so w has to be continuous. And therefore, we cannot have any x or y dependency. We can only shift by two pi. So we can shift phi altogether by two pi. 
Now, in our case, we are in between. We said that the, uh, the symmetry allows us to shift by an arbitrary function of x and an arbitrary function of y. And therefore, the, the symmetry that we gauge is an integer valued function of x and an integer valued function of y. These two are integers. And this is the identification we consider. Notice it's not as big as here, but it's not as small as here. It's just right. So this means that the dipole symmetry that we consider of shifting phi by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y is not R, but as a group, it should be thought of as a U1 because this alpha is identified with alpha plus two pi. So we have what we normally have with two pi. So normally this is a constant and the constant is identified with a constant plus two pi. So that's why it's U1. On the lattice, this is an arbitrary function of x and y. And at each point, the function is two pi periodic. And, but for us, we have this thing that is in between. Now, if you're a high energy physicist, at this point, you should cry, this system must have t-duality. It has all the hallmarks of t-duality. And indeed, we can just t-dualize our system. We can take the scalar field phi that we studied and express the system in terms of phi tilde using this dictionary. And as we do that, the spectrum of the theory is invariant. In fact, this is a transformation you could do at the level of the Lagrangian. We had momentum and winding modes with energy of order one over A, and the t-duality exchanges them. It all sounds very, very familiar. It's very reminiscent of the compact boson in one plus one dimensions. The momentum and winding symmetries appear, are, are unbroken and t-duality exchanges them. The main, the, the main differences are that A, we are in two plus one rather than in one plus one dimensions. And second, all the energies, the energies of these winding and momentum modes is infinite. But other than that, it's all the same. At this point, I would like to discuss the robustness question. Is it, the, what, is what we did, is it meaningful or not? Is it robust? So the continuum theory has a momentum symmetry and a winding symmetry. The lattice model had only momentum symmetry. This is related to the question that was asked earlier, at what energy scale the symmetry is violated? So on the lattice, we have only the momentum, but not the winding. So it motivates the question, is the continuum theory robust? This is very similar to the question I mentioned earlier in the talk about the costelitz taulitz point. For radius above the costelitz taulitz point, the theory is robust because the winding, the winding symmetry is an accidental symmetry. The lowest winding operator is irrelevant, but at lower radius, the winding symmetry is not robust, and therefore we have the costelitz saulis transition. It's still meaningful to discuss the continuum form of field theory at smaller radius, but that's not what we get from the lattice unless we do something special. So what happens here? So, as I said before, this is determined by the irrelevance of the momentum preserving but winding violating operator e to the i phi tilde. This is the lowest one. So when this guy acts on the vacuum, it creates a state that carries winding, winding charge and its energy is high. And I offer two interpretation. I said either we take this state seriously and then there are <clears throat> sorry, either we take this state seriously and we analyze them in detail, or we say their energy is so high, so we don't care about them. But either way, this operator, when it acts on the vacuum, creates a state of very high energy. This means that it's not just an irrelevant operator, it's very, very irrelevant. And it's very irrelevant, and as a result, this phi theory is robust. So our phi system with all these peculiarities is very much like the xy model in one plus one dimension, but the radius bigger than the cost of its power point. So this is what I wanted to say about the phi theory and its global symmetry. Next, I'd like to gauge it. So for that- hey, Nadi, can I ask I'm some questions to... before you go on? Yes. Is this, um, this is Clay, yes. Yeah, I recognize your voice, but I don't see your face. Yeah, sorry. Um, so first question is, is there an analog of the radius deprivation for your phi theory? Uh, yes, there is. Well, there's a dimensionless number in front of the kinetic term. There are two kinetic, two kinetic terms, but you can, you can rescale X and Y and set them to one. So in that sense, the answer is no. I see. And um, say differently, they, we do not have the X phi, the Y phi. This is not a good operator. 
if you follow our rules of what is and what is not meaningful, DX5, DY5 is not a meaningful operator. In fact, this operator was not included in our Lagrangian. Right. But if I look at the lattice model, the XY plaquette model, and change the coefficient of the cosine, can I drive a transition? If you just change the coefficient of the cosine, you do not. You can absorb, in the continuum limit, you can absorb that in X and Y. I see. Okay, thank you. And the correspond, the, up, the nearest neighbor operator, you can turn it on on the, on the lattice. It will ruin this whole structure that we discussed, but it also ruins the global symmetry, the momentum symmetry that we imposed. We will later discuss models where this is not the case, but in this case, in this case, this is the, the situation. Sorry, Nadi, I had a question similar to Clay's. Um, so you, I, I was expecting that if you put a radius, if you include a radius for this, uh, this circle value field, that you could make the winding modes heavy and the momentum modes light and vice versa. Right. You don't, this, you can't do that? Right that. You're completely right about that, but it's parametric. This whole thing is in all these coefficients, if I set to one, the energy of the winding, so if you put coefficients mu1 and mu2 in front of these two terms, the actual energy of the states depends on the length of the system and on mu1 and mu2, in addition to the power of A that I emphasized. So the proper way to do that is don't set any coefficient to one, keep all the coefficients in the Lagrangian, repeat all the algebra that I did. It's actually not a lot of work here. And you're getting, going to get a formula for the energy of the states that depends on two numbers in the Lagrangian, this A parameter and the size of the system. And your intuition will end up being correct. Okay, so let's gauge this system. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Uh, so, so far this plaquette XY model is defined in 2 plus 1D. Can it be generalized to say so three? This model can be generalized in a billion different ways. So first of all, instead of being XY, it could be ZN. That's the first generalization. This was studied in a lot of detail on the lattice by, by various methods, including simulations and so forth. There's a phase transition. There's a whole story there. It can also be generalized to three plus one dimensions. And tomorrow, Shu Heng will mention it a little bit. This would be kind of the starting point of the discussion in three plus one dimension. But in this talk, I wanted to focus first on one model and analyze it in detail. And now I'm going to generalize it slightly to gauge systems. There are many extensions and you know, people ask me about stat that this is a huge literature with thousands of papers. And so far we discussed one model in two plus one dimensions. Now I'm going to discuss another model in two plus one dimension. We'll take it one step at a time. Tomorrow, uh, this will be the more advanced class. It will be in three plus one dimensions. But I emphasize again, it will be self-contained. Self so if you didn't like my presentation, it doesn't matter, you can start from scratch tomorrow. So this is the gauge system. And again, it was analyzed uh, by a lot of people from different perspectives. This is a subset of the original references. Most of the discussion in the literature is in three plus one dimensions, will be in two plus one dimensions. And most of the discussion in the literature is in a Hamiltonian formalism. So I thought I would do it here on Euclidean, use the Euclidean formulation on a Euclidean, a, in a Euclidean lattice. So we have a two plus one dimension of Euclidean lattice. So it is in a gauge theory, we put phases get on the time like links. And we also put phases on the plaquettes rather than on the spatial plaquettes, rather than on the spatial links. And the interaction is on cubes. We have plaquette terms from two. So we have the product of the plaquette phases from at different times. And we multiply by the link elements around four link elements around the cube. And the gauge, this is a gauge theory. The gauge parameters are as always at the sides of the cube. And the gauge in the, every phase rotates the plaquette in the links that it touches in an obvious way, such as this is gauge invariant. So this is the lattice model. It's completely well-defined. Let's write it in the continuum. So we have two gauge fields, time-like gauge fields, A0, and space-like gauge fields, AXY. 
and they have the following gauge symmetry. A0 goes to A0 plus D0 alpha, and AXY is shifted by DX, DY alpha. So, so now we can a, ask what's not the a, not a, a, AXY is not equal to minus A sub YX? No, no, it's, it's actually symmetric, but it's, it's symmetric. Doesn't matter for, for our purposes here, it doesn't matter. It just labels the plaquette. So this is just a name XY because we are in two plus one dimensions. But it's not a two form. It's not a two form. If, if at all, it's a symmetric two form. I don't know what it's called when it's symmetric. It's, symmet it's actually symmetric in X and Y. And one way to see that is from here. You see this term, do you see my cursor? the pointer? Yes, that term is why I asked. Ah, so it is symmetric in X and Y, but in this particular case, we are in two plus one dimension, it doesn't really matter. It, it just sits in the pockets. The only way it matters is to ask, how does it transform under 90 degree rotations in the plane? And it transforms the way it does here. It's, it's a symmetric tensor. So we can form a gauge invariant electric field. But excuse me. Can I interrupt? Sorry. Yes. Uh, I wonder, can you show, I have a related question to Liu Jun earlier. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. Can you show the T-duality slide? Maybe two. Yeah, this is a transformation you can do in the continuum Lagrangian. It's not true on the lattice. The lattice model is not T-dual. In the continuum, we do have this T-duality. And this is already true for the ordinary compact boson in one plus one dimensions. The model on the lattice does not have T-duality. In fact, it doesn't even have the winding symmetry, but it is true in the continuum. The same thing is true here. This model in the continuum has T-duality, but not T-duality on, on, on the lattice. It has something like T-duality, which is called Cranovenia duality, which can be shown on the lattice, but it's not, it's almost the same as this T-duality, but not quite. I can elaborate more on that later if you ask. Can I so, see the slide? Sorry? Can I see that slide just uh, for a second or something? I just want to double check one thing. And also I have a question on that, that slide is that the origin ask whether this model, the, this XY or phi model can be generalized to three plus one D. I was wondering whether those properties still exist in higher I'll dimensions. I'll soon give a review of what will happen in three plus one dimensions. And, and you'll have, hear a lot more about it tomorrow. But at the moment, let's stick to two plus one. I, I, yeah, there are many models and we can take the discussion in many different ways and, and all of them are valid. I picked one of them, we can take another one, but that's the one I picked. And if later when we get to it, you're not satisfied, I'll be happy to explain both. So this is the gauge invariant combination. And it can be thought of as gauging the global symmetry that we had before. So if we write gauging is taking the current and mul multiplying them by gauge fields, and then the gauge symmetry is satisfied because of the conservation equation. This is gauging the momentum symmetry that we discussed earlier, but now we're studying only the, the pure gauge system. So we have a gauge theory, which would ask, how is the flux quantized? So far I discussed it locally. What can we say about the global features? So the gauge parameter alpha is subject to the same identifications we had on phi. So we call that alpha, so alpha the same as phi before is identified with alpha plus two pi times an integer function of x plus an integer function of y. This is the identification we have on alpha, which is the same thing we had before. And therefore we have a large gauge transformation by this alpha. This is precisely the function I mentioned earlier that has winding, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the analog of a large gauge transformation for this gauge theory. And if we can have such a large gauge transformation, we can consider the system in the Euclidean box with periodic boundary conditions, on, dot periodic boundary conditions in the time direction, and put this as the transition function as we shift time, as time goes to time plus the length of time. And just from this property and the behavior of the electric field, you, the, formula for the electric field, you can see that the, the flux is quantized as follows. It's the integral of E x y d time dx or d time dy is two pi times a delta function. And the coefficient here has to be two pi because no other coefficient uh, is, would make this function a valid function for the transition function. So it's the same arithmetic 
is with the winding symmetry, what are the allowed winding configurations? These determine what are the allowed large gate transformations, and this determine what are the allowed fluxes. So let's write a Lagrangian. We have an electric field, so we write a Lagrangian with an electric field square. We can also have a theta parameter, and theta is identified with theta plus two pi because of the quantized fluxes. Now we analyze it, so we choose A0 equals zero gauge, and if A0 equals zero, Gauss law sets dx dy of E equals zero, that comes from the Lagrangian. So up to a gate transformation, these are the configurations. So A was, A0 was set to zero, and AXY is such functions. The function, it's linear combination of two functions. We put the length here to simplify expressions later. But the key thing I want to emphasize is there is no function of X and Y. So the effective degrees of freedom in this temporal gauge are a function of X plus a function of Y. In particular, there are no local excitations. This is actually an amusing point that this system, although being, in, despite being in two plus one dimensions, is very similar to an ordinary U1 gauge theory in one plus one dimensions. It's similar in the sense that it has no magnetic field, it has a theta parameter, and there are no local excitations. There's still an infinite number of modes that we are left with. In this system, there's only one mode, the holonomy. Here, the analog of the holonomy are these infinite number of modes. But the key thing is that there are no local excitations, very much like this system. And this starts sounding like a theme because we had this relation between the three plus one and the two plus one dimension of phi system, and now between this peculiar tensor gauge theory and the ordinary gauge theory between three plus one and two plus one. What are the, we have a gauge theory, what are the defects? So now we have to write, recall our theory is free. Our system does not have any charge excite, char, gauge charge excitations. It's a pure gauge theory, but it can have defects. And the defects reflect high energy, high energy probe particles. So the simplest defect is such a time along the time direction, we integrate A0, that's clearly gauge invariant. And it represents the word line of the charge particle at fixed position. And you can check using the gauge symmetry that this particle cannot move in space. If you try to shift it in space, you're going to violate gauge symmetry and there's no connection that allows you to add another term that shifts it in space. So it is a fractal. We can also consider a dipole. Take two of these guys, one with charge one and one with charge minus one and put them in two positions, X1 and X2. And then it is represented by such a, <clears throat> by such a strip in X1 and X2. And now we do have the spatial gauge field AXY allowing it to move in Y. So this dipole is two particles separated in X, then they can move in Y, but they cannot move in X. So in the condensed matter in the fracton literature, these are known as linons. I do not know how to pronounce this word. And the key point here is that the restricted mobility follows from the underlying gauge symmetry. So this is not something that was put in by hand, it just follows from this gauge symmetry. So this is a much more compact way of seeing the restricted mobility because I don't have an interacting system and I don't have to look for what kind of excitations exist. I just look at the Lagrangian with low energies, it's a free Lagrangian. And then I ask what are the allowed defects and I find the restricted mobility. What are Nadi, the Nadi, can you go back for one second um, to the previous slide? So you if, for one second. Sorry? You said, can you go back for one second? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the um, if uh, if so if the curve C is such that Y is constant, you can do the integral and then you indeed get two particle two Wilson That's lines right. at opposite charge. But if the curve C is non-trivial, then you have a non-trivial integral in X. How should I physically interpret that? Well, the, the, you just integrate the X. No, but it's the, you said it's, it's like two it's, particles it's that are separated. Strip. This up this dipole is like a strip. So you have two points, there's a line between them, and now they can move in this direction, but there's always a line in X. Do you see me? Yes, I see you. So it can move in Y, but not in X. It cannot move this way, so, but there's a line here. But the line disappears if it doesn't move. What do you mean? Well, if the dy term is zero. No, the might, the might or might not be dependent on the y. This system is, there's a lot of 
you can ask what this operator depends on. And we, we analyze it in detail in the paper. What kind of deformations make changes and which do not. But in this particular case, this is a gauge invariant object and, and it is what it is. Okay, so thank you. The flip side of all these defects is we can make operators by making the defect at fixed time. So it's in space, this is an operator. So here we have Wilson strip. So if we take this a uh, dipole that we discussed before, we can put it in space. So we integrate the X. So this is the DX integral that uh, Clay just asked about. And we do a line integral around Y around the whole lattice. So this is a Wilson strip. We integrate the Y and the X. It depends on the two endpoints. And we also have point operators, the electric field, but because of Gauss law, the electric field is a sum of a function of X plus a function of Y. So there are no local operators. Whoops. So there are no local operators uh, in the system. And that's a, so there are no local operators. So in that sense, it's again, very similar to U1 gauge theory, one plus one dimensions. Let me flash the spectrum, I'm running out of time. We have to quantize these modes. We said these are the effective modes that we have to quantize. In the, the problem in one plus one dimensions, when we, for, when we go to the holonomy, we have just one rotor. Here we have an infinite number of rotors, an infinite number of one per X and one per Y. So if we ignore the zero mode, this was done more carefully in our paper, but just to get a feel, let's ignore the zero mode and focus on one of them. We get this term from the electric field square. We get this term from the theta term. And so this is the Lagrangian. And the large gate transformation imposes some identification of F by two pi times a delta. You can check that explicitly. And therefore the radius of the rotor is infinite. So this is in a way, this is similar but different than what we saw in the pi system. We have an infinite number of rotors, but the periodicity of the rotor before was two pi at every point, and here it's two pi times a delta function. So the periodicity of the rotor is infinite, and correspondingly, the energy of the rotor is very low. In fact, if we put the whole system here on the lattice, and again, I emphasize, not, it's not the original lattice, all the energies are small. These are the energies. N is an integer, and for every x, we have an integer, and the energies are proportional to A, so that in the continuum limit, this whole tower of states goes down. We have an infinite ground state degeneracy, eh, but we do not have any local excitations. So this is very peculiar. I'd like to move to the ZN gauge theory and I can do that quickly because we'll just Higgs what we had before. So again, we take a Euclidean lattice and this is basically a copy of the slide I had for U1, except that everything is Zn. How are we going to do it in the continuum? In the continuum, we take, do the same thing. We start with the U1 system. We add the phi theory with charge N and we hix it to Zn. The way to do that is to write this Lagrangian. B and E are Lagrange multipliers. A0 and AXY appeared in the U1 gauge theory I studied earlier. The gate symmetry of A0 and AXY we copied from before. And phi transforms under in the corresponding symmetry with this by alpha. But the key point is that there's a coefficient n here needed for gauge invariance. And as a result, it hixes the system to Zn. And we can also dualize phi. We can form the same duality transformation we mentioned in the phi. So you see, by analyzing the phi system carefully, now our results just start pouring in because we don't need to think again how to dualize. When we dualize it, we get a skip, another field phi tilde multiplying EXY and phi tilde is periodic. So we have a BF type description of this system. And what are the defects? The defects are essentially as in the U1 system, the U1 system, except that the nth power of the defect is a trivial defect. So we have fractons and we had these dipole linons. And this is the Lagrangian, what are the gauge invariant operators? So first we have the Wilson strip, exactly as before, except that now its nth power is one. And we also have a magnetic operator, the exponential of this phi tilde, its nth power is one. 
Gauss law says that it's dependence on x and y is a function of x times a function of y. And they satisfy the following algebra. So we have a strip in two dimensional space. You can see my the strip. And we have an operator O. And if O touches the strip, the strip, W O is the same as O W times the nth word of unity. And if it doesn't touch it, they commute. So this is a famous algebra. It comes under various names, shift and clock, or a Heisenberg algebra, and so forth. What's the spectrum of the theory? Take the Lagrangian. V and E are Lagrange multipliers. So the Lagrange multipliers tell us that this is zero and this is zero. And then for every configuration of phi, we can solve for a zero and we can solve for a x y. So this is the solution. And therefore the ground states are the space of phi modulo gauge transformations. And they're generated by our winding states, the same phi configuration that I showed earlier and will also figure tomorrow. So for every point x zero and y zero, we have an integer, kind of telling us how many times we jump. And accounting for the common zero modes and placing on the lattice, altogether, we end up with this number of states. So n of the zn to the power lx plus ly minus one, minus one because we have to subtract the zero mode. So this is the number of states of the system. So there are no local excitations, and the number of states is n to a power that grows linearly with the number of sites in the lattice. So let's summarize the behavior of this system. It's gapped. We have only the zero energy states. There are no, no high energy excitations. The lattice model has a lot of high energy excitations, but not the continuum model. In fact, that's what we wanted. We wanted a system that captures only the long distances we have. The spectrum is easily worked out. It's the simplest representation of this algebra of operators. So that's why we get this n to this power. And in, in the quantum information literature, these are called logical operators. We have this local operator e to the i phi tilde. It generates the electric symmetry. It is a symmetry on the lattice. So that's a good operator to study. And we also have the strip operators that they generate an emergent magnetic symmetry exists in the continuum, but not on the lattice. So the operator O preserves all the symmetries of the lattice, but not the emergent symmetry. And therefore, this system is actually not robust. If we start from the lattice system, then we are not going to land on precisely this continuum model that we study, but we get this continuum model perturbed by this exponential operator. So this system is not robust. Let me give you a teaser. Tomorrow we'll study, Shu Heng will study exactly the same system in three plus one dimensions, and then it will be robust. But in two plus one dimensions, it is robust. It is not robust. Now we saw that the phi system is very similar to the phi, ordinary phi system in one plus one dimensions. And the U1 gauge theory is very similar to the ordinary U1 gauge theory in one plus one dimensions. I'd like to draw some analogies between this system and the one plus one dimension of the end gauge theory. So this system is very similar to an ordinary Z end gauge theory in one plus one dimension. It has such a continuum description. We could put it of course on the lattice, but this is the continuum description with two Lagrange multipliers. It has a BF type description with phi tilde being the dual of phi times E. There are no bulk excitations very much like in three plus one dimensions. And on a circle, it has n states. In terms of the gauge theory, there can be thought of as the, the Zn holonomy around the circle. Or in terms of the mode phi tilde, there's a Zn ordinary symmetry, which is spontaneously broken. And this is an emergent Zn symmetry. And since it's spontaneously broken, there are n states. And again, the Zn, ten, the Zn ordinary gauge theory in one plus one dimensions is not robust because we can turn on this operator O. So we extended this discussion to three plus one dimensions and the next two slides are a preview of tomorrow's talk. In two plus one dimensions, we preserved only a Z4 of rotation, 90 degree rotations. In three plus one dimensions, we preserve the cubic group 
it's actually S4, the permutation group of four elements generated by 90 degree rotations in SO3. So this is the global space symmetry that we preserve. And just as our system today, we're very similar to ordinary field theories in one plus one dimensions. Tomorrow, whatever Shuhang will do in three plus one dimension will be very similar to ordinary field theories in two plus one dimensions. So we'll discuss a five theory. Somebody here already asked me about the generalization to three plus one dimension. The discussion will be similar, except that this theory is dual not to another scalar theory, not a non-gauge theory, but to another gauge theory, A hat, some exotic gauge theory. And the U1 gauge theory that we study today is, there is a similar discussion in three plus one dimensions, except that it is dual to another gauge, another non-gauge theory, which we call phi hat. And again, notice the pattern we have phi system with a global symmetry, A system with this global symmetry is gauged, and then we use phi to Higgs A to find a Zn gauge theory. And here we found three dual descriptions of it. We either Higgs A using phi, or we Higgs A hat using phi hat, or we can dualize and find a BF description involving these two gauge fields. So these are these three exotic Zn symmetries. The Zn gauge theories, which are all dual to each other. And this particular system turns out to be this, this turns out to describe the long distance behavior of one of the most celebrated fractal models known as the X cube model, except that here we do everything with continuum fields. So we reproduce all the long distance behavior, namely all the logical operators all the ground state, degener the ground state degeneracy and all the metrics elements of the uh, logical operators. And instead of having charged excitations, we have defects. This is the way it always works with the gauge theories. The, we have these defects described by various Wilson lines in the time direction and various strips in the time direction. And they reproduce all the excitations of the X cube model with their restricted mobility. And of course, the main point is that this is robust. This, sorry, the main point is that this is universal. We capture all the universal information using the continuum of Lagrangian. And this is a ZN gauge theory, which is similar to the discussion in two plus one dimension. That's what I said here, except one crucial fact that it is robust. There is no local operator that can destabilize the system. And therefore, even if you don't like these global symmetries and you don't like this system, once you're there, you can make small deformations at low energies, sorry, at high energy, you can make small deformations at short distances, and that does not destroy the system. So let me summarize the talk, because I'm approaching the end and we'll have some time for questions. First of all, fractals exhibit interesting properties, which seem incompatible with the framework of continuum quantum field theory. That was true even before we started the work. Fractons are very interesting and they seem not to fit into quantum field theory. I'll be with you in a second. And we presented non-standard continuum field theories and they were non-standard in various ways. First of all, they were invariant under, only under discrete rotations. We didn't have com com complete continuous rotation. The underlying orientation of the lattice is important in the continuum theory, but we do have translation symmetry. They also exhibit these exotic global and gauge symmetries, which we presented in the continuum notation. And the key point is that we found that we need to use fields and gauge transformations that are discontinuous, and maybe even singular. So they were not as discontinuous and as singular as on the lattice, but they were more discontinuous than in standard continuum theory. So they are kind of in between. And as I kept emphasizing, the main point of these continuum field theories is that they capture the universal properties of the lattice system. So we focus on the long distance behavior and all the information about the long distance physics, the operators, ground state degeneracy, the behavior of probe particles, all this is captured correctly by the quantum theory, by the continuum theory. As an outlook, I think it's absolutely essential to make the treatment of the discontinuous field more precise. We kind of invented some kind of calculus, which fields are 
which configurations are allowed, which configurations are not allowed, how to take derivatives, what's periodic, what's not periodic, and so forth. We were motivated by the existing lattice system. We wanted to reproduce the results of the lattice and that guided us. And we found some rules with the derivatives and what's continuous and what's not, and we ended up landing on our feet. I think it's important to put down a more precise mathematical setting. I spoke with some mathematicians. I got some pointers to things in the math literature. Uh, some of them were obviously irrelevant. Most of them, I couldn't even figure out whether they are relevant or not. Maybe somebody who's more mathematically inclined than I am could tell us how to make this story more precise. The second question is the underlying geometry of these gauge fields. We discuss various twisted bundles. In tomorrow's talks, the gauge theory will be more sophisticated than today, but we already saw some twisted bundles today. We've got this flux quantization and so forth. And again, we were really trying to reproduce the lattice. And whenever we were confused, we went back to the lattice and we got it straight there. I think there must be a more geometric way to state that. Another big open question is how to place these systems on more complicated manifolds, starting with a, a curved space. If it could be even just introduce a little bit of curvature, that I don't think should be an issue. Just introduce a little metric deformation. That would not be an issue. It's important that these systems are not rotationally invariant, so one has to be a little bit more careful, but I'll soon be with the question. A, one has to be a little bit more careful, but I think this should be done. There are also many interesting global issues, putting them on, people suggested putting them on foliated manifolds, and this is, goes way beyond my pay grade, so I do not know how uh, to address that. We should repeat the same analysis for other lattice models. There are tons of lattice models, and we considered only 11 lattice models in this, in this body of work. And I'm currently working with a bunch of postdocs and graduate students. I'm kind of trying to chart out what is out there in the literature and how we could phrase, how we could fit them in a, in, into our framework. I, it's kind of incremental work. There's a lot of work to be done here. And what's perhaps more exciting is to find a new such models. So I think that would be even more exciting. So this story will be continued tomorrow in Shu Heng's talk. He will talk primarily on three plus one dimensions. And I emphasize again, the talk will be self-contained. If you didn't pay attention here or you found my presentations offensive or whatever, or tomorrow it will be much better. Thank you and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nati, for great, great lecture. So there are several questions. I think uh, Dalio has the first. Uh, uh, you can okay you can. uh yeah thank you i want to ask two questions the first question you're saying that you mentioned in your one slide saying you uh there's something wrong to treat this as the gosun boson of spontaneous spontaneous breaking or momentum i'm, I'm sorry could, could you speak slower i didn't understand okay i want to understand why is it wrong to say if this is the gosun boson of the spontaneous symmetry breaking with the momentum shift symmetry Right, because the symmetry, it's the same system. In, if you consider the XY model in one plus one dimensions, okay. symmetry appears to be spontaneously broken classically. But in the quantum theory, the system is restored. In the condensed matter literature, this is known as Merwin Wagner. In the high energy community, this is known as Coleman. But the symmetry is restored in the quantum theory. Okay. The same thing is true here. Classically, the symmetry appears to be spontaneously broken. But in the quantum theory, it is restored. Okay, uh, second question. Can you make some comments? Uh, this UV IR mixing is quite interesting. Can you make some comments? The possibility to use it to solve the stand model hierarchy problem? I'm sorry? Uh, this UV IR mixing is quite interesting, saying that you cannot decouple UV completely from IR. Can you use this idea to solve the stand model hierarchy problem? At the moment, the answer is no, but over the years, I've, ver I've been very interested in UVIR mixing. Uh, 
for a variety of reasons. They appear in non-commutative geometry and so forth. Here, it's really surprising that they appear in a lattice system and our continuum theory manages to capture it. Okay. So for me, the interesting question is, can we have continuum field theories that exhibit UVIR mixing? And the UVIR mixing is, does not really violate the renormalization group picture, but yes. it's still there. Then there's another question of whether it's good for anything. That's uh, for the far, for me, this is, I, I think this is for the far future, but maybe this can be used for the hierarchy problem. I do not exclude that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, the second, uh, second uh, person I can ask, no, it's not Napado. You can just uh, unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, I have some questions regarding the anomaly of um, exotic uh, symmetry. First of all, does it make sense to talk about anomaly uh, in these uh, exotic global symmetry? And uh, second, is uh, any of your model that you study have this uh, anomaly? In, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. And I, I assume you're asking what what should be called a true anomaly. The models are consistent. There's nothing wrong with this system. The question That's right. is whether uh, there are non-trivial correlation functions which which uh, exhibit anomalous behavior. And in That's fact, right. if you go back to the Phi system that I described, we had a momentum symmetry and a winding symmetry. And although either of them separately is not anomalous, there is a tooth anomaly, a mixed tooth anomaly between the momentum and the winding symmetry. Very much like the compact boson in one plus one dimension. There again, there's a momentum symmetry and a winding symmetry. Neither has an anomaly, but there is a mixed anomaly, mixed a tooth anomaly between the momentum and the winding symmetry, which prevents you from gauging both of them simultaneously. In fact, for the people in condensed matter, this should be very natural. The momentum symmetry exists on the lattice, and the winding symmetry is not on the lattice. If the winding symmetry had existed on the lattice, then there wouldn't have been an anomaly. But the answer to your question, yes, in this particular case, there is an anomaly. You can try and generalize this in many different ways. You can add fermions, you can ask whether you do add fermions, there are other anomalies. That has not been done. And this can be matched. Well, I, uh, I could really again emphasize, you ask how many papers are there all together about quantum field theory, various number of dimensions, scalar fields, interaction, etc. I don't know, a million papers, 100,000, I don't know, many papers out there. What we have done, most of this talk was a free scalar field. This is really, really the beginning of a lot of stuff that can be done. Then we did a free gauge theory. And Tomorrow, there will be a few more free theories, but these are all free theories. We did not include interactions. We did not include fermions. So all sorts of complications can be added, and this has not been done yet. That's one of the reasons I find this exciting, because there's so many things to do. So they have no um, characterization, systematic characterization of anomaly in there. I do not have a complete characterization, but I could try and ask Let's couple them to gauge fields and see whether we could preserve gauge invariance. So this is something we can do in the, in the continuum. And the analysis is straightforward. You take this Lagrangian that you wrote down, you couple it to gauge fields for the momentum and for winding. And it turns out that you can couple one of them. You can couple them either to a momentum gauge, gauge either the momentum gauge symmetry to a gauge field or the winding gauge symmetry to a gauge field, but you cannot do both. This is the hallmark of an anomaly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are you done? It's, uh, it's Ethan Lake. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, I guess I had uh, two quick questions. One, one was uh, maybe a little bit silly. What, to what, what extent does like a field theory description Could you speak of a... louder or get closer to the microphone? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, is this, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, uh, to, to what extent is like a, a field theory description of a Fermi liquid kind of within this philosophy? Here you also have low energy stuff at high momentum and infinite number of conserved charges and et cetera. I, I don't think I have a good, I don't think I have a good answer to that. Okay. But it's not because the answer doesn't exist. It's a statement about my ignorance. 
Okay, well, well uh, okay, then, then uh, second question is, I, I think I, I might have missed this, but uh, when, you, when you're talking about robustness of these various phases, we, you, you had some comments about like the energetics of these uh, operators that were gen generating the, uh, the configurations with charge. So are you talking about the general discussion of robustness in the introduction or when I discuss the phi theory? Uh, I guess m more in terms of the phi theory. I, I, I was wondering when you're talking about robustness, do you have like a, do you guys consider implementing some kind of RG transformation or do you just look at kind of energy? No, because the theory is free, so we just solved it. Okay, just look you at see, this is the advantage of a free theory. I think this is the slide you're referring to. Yeah. Okay, so how do we check for some for robustness? We go to low energies, we understand the system at low energies, and we make a list of all the operators. And then we ask ourselves, can any, what happens if I add any of these operators to my Lagrangian or Hamiltonian? What happens to the system? So if I impose some symmetry in the UV and say, okay, I should not add operators that violate that symmetry. But if I have a symmetry that appears at long distances, but I don't see in the UV, some uh, the, 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 lo the short distance theory would not going to put me exactly, at the, might not put me exactly at the point that I thought in the continuum, but might put me at a point which is slightly different in the space of operators. And therefore, I should check whether I could, what happens to my continuum theory when I deform the long distance theory by turning on this operator. If the leading operator that violates the symmetry is irrelevant, its dimension is high, then it doesn't matter. If, on the other hand, the, there is a relevant operator violating the symmetry, what, violating this symmetry that is not there at short distances, then it will typically be generated, and then the system will not be robust. So I'm sure you studied the, this system, the costal at solid point at shorted radius. In the continuum, we have both the momentum and the winding symmetry. And high energy physicists who study it in the continuum say, oh, nothing special happens at the costal at solid point. You just go to shorter radii, and you have both the winding and momentum symmetries all the way. A condensed matter person will tell you, no, we have only the momentum symmetry at short distances. We don't have the winding symmetry at short distances. And therefore, the low energy of Lagrangian is typically deformed by the lowest winding operator. And we should check whether it's relevant or not. So for large radius, above the cost of its radius, the winding operator is irrelevant. And therefore, we do find this continuum theory and the continuum theory is robust. A smaller radii, a, the winding operator is relevant, and therefore, unless we fine tune, we do not find this continuum of Raja. So the continuum system studied by high energy physicists occurs from the lattice to a small radii only if we fine tune operators. And as we make the radius smaller and smaller, there are more and more relevant winding operators and therefore, we need to do more and more fine tuning. So all of these things are allowed to do. You're allowed to do the fine tuning. This is just a different system. Yeah, so the so notion so of robustness so is exactly that. Now, this is completely standard, and various people have different ways of presenting it. I presented the more high energy way of doing it. In condensed matter, people like to talk about proliferation of vortices. This is all the same thing. The point here is that the vortices that by in our system, the vortices that violate the winding symmetry have infinite energy, and therefore they cannot proliferate. Yeah, so, so in general, to, 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 when you're talking about irrelevance or relevance- I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, when, when you're in general talking about this notion of relevance or irrelevance, you're, you're still talking about like doing some kind of uh, rescaling transformation of space there's nothing if, you can think about this way. So in, in, if you have a conformal field theory at long distances, in the standard system, you have a conformal field theory at long distances. So you have a list of operators and every operator has a dimension. And if this operator has dimension less, the dimension is too small, it's relevant, then the system will not be robust. If it's higher dimension, then the system is robust. But, but can, can you do can you do like a, a program where you integrate out high momentum modes or something like that in yes, the system? Yes, exactly. So even the though you have continuum Lagrangian that I described, mm -hmm. 
amounts to integrating out high momentum modes, but in this more subtle way that I integrated out modes that both PX and PY are high, but modes where PX okay. is zero and PY is small was not integrated out. So, so it's not like a uniform. It's not of... like a uniform. That's why it's yeah. so subtle. But okay, all these peculiarities that we have, the UVIR mixing, the fact that it does not work at the standard renormalization group, it's exactly that. Momentum with arbitrary, with generic high PX and PY have been integrated out. We do not allow functions of phi, phi which are discontinuous, arbitrarily discontinuous functions of X and Y. We did allow things which are continuous fun discontinuous function of X with smooth function of Y, mm. et cetera, right? So that's, that's what we allow. So it's either a discontinuous function of X, which is independent of Y or the other way around. Okay. And then with the winding states, we went to even more subtle configuration. But we do not allow most of the configurations of the lattice, if you could count them, most of them have been integrated out. So by going to the continuum, you really cut rid of a lot of the lattice stuff which is not universal and we kept only what is universal. Yeah, okay, great, great. That, that's very helpful. Okay, uh, next one will be Liu Jun, Liu Jun Zhou. Uh, I basically want you to ask the same question as Ethan, so it's already answered. Thanks. So I answer it? Next one. Yeah, okay. you answered. Thank you. Next one will be that was easy. Perfect. Next one will be Professor Clay Cordova from University of Chicago. Thank you for my distinguished uh, introduction. I'm not sure why I get it. Um, the, uh, I had just kind of a general philosophical question again. Do you expect, Nadi, that these kind of uh, dipole field theories um, are connected to regular, uh, let's say, Lorentz invariant, what we might call ordinary quantum field theories by renormalization group flows? if we perturb by, say, Lorentz violating operators or things like that? I don't see why not. So I think the question you're asked is, can we start the control distances by an ordinary Lorentz invariant theory perturbed by relevant operators and perhaps fine tune the UV theory to, to some special point? Is that what you mean? Yeah, and, and find at long distances a dipole. I see, theory. I don't see why not. I really don't see why not. You might need to do a lot of fine tuning, but so. Yeah. Okay. This, yeah. And that's why I think it is so important to fit that into the standard language. Right, the, the language that I tried to fit it into is precisely the language that you claim to think about field theory. So I tried to fit it into that language and I wrote a continuum Lagrangian. I wrote a mm -hmm. continuum Lagrangian and I just analyzed it the way a continuum Lagrangian is being analyzed. And if there were some peculiarities along the way, then I just had to face them. But uh, I emphasize it's a free theory, so there's no room to hide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question. Um, do you anticipate that there's some kind of widget that takes a d-dimensional regular quantum field theory and turns it into a d plus one dimensional dipole theory? I, I don't like the phrase dipole field theory. Well, okay, Wh whatever but you other want to than call that, it. Yeah. I would love it to be the case. And it's really amazing how we didn't ask for it. And, but this thing continued to happen. Now, it might be that the systems that we looked at are very special. And this is true in these systems, but that's not the case in other systems. Well, they're very similar in the sense that they have some similarities, but they still have all these other peculiarities. Sure, yeah. I do not know if there is a, such a thing. And I think that the only way to answer this question is to explore more examples. So the way I would like progress to happen is that somebody smart is more knowledgeable than I am, uh, can address these questions 
and then in parallel, we should study more and more lattice models and then pick them into this framework. I strongly believe that every one of these lattice models can be fit into, uh, can, can fit this framework. And then maybe a pattern will emerge and we will understand a better way of thinking about all of them. And then maybe we can find examples like the ones you mentioned. Or maybe we could uh, find this widget that mm -hmm. relates them. At the moment, I think our understanding is very primitive. Mm -hmm. They're not there yet. But this question has not been, so a lot of people study these fractal-like fractal models uh, from various perspectives, but not from this perspective. Uh, it's just this hasn't been done. And, and it's, you know, it's only the beginning. So there's room for all sorts of surprises. Okay, thanks. Next one, uh, Jack, Jack, Jack McNamara. Um, hi, yeah. I was just wondering, maybe related to Clay's question, whether you have any thoughts about embedding these models into either, say, a you know, Lorentz invariance breaking twist of a supersymmetric theory or, or into string theory. Um, well, this will add a lot more bells and whistles. So far, we mostly did the free scalar field. So it's like, taking, let's make an analogy. So you study quantum field theory and you study probably your favorite book. No, I think, uh, well, your favorite book. And you study this, the, the free scalar field and you analyze it and you know, you find the mode expansion and you look at that. And then down the road, there will be pi to the fourth and gauge theories and interactions. And then there would be string theory and curved space. So there's a lot to do down the road. But we haven't even done fermions. We haven't done non-abelian gauge theories. We haven't done any interactions. So I do not know how it fits in, in broader frameworks. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe yeah. it doesn't. Thank you. Uh, next will be, again, uh, Professor Clay Cordova, he's coming back from the defense committee trying to answer ask more questions. Clay. Uh, yeah, I just had one more question. Um, defense committee? Would, I have no idea what that was about. Um, the, uh, the other question was about, um, so there are these kind of funny churn simons theories that Costello has worked on. Uh, yes. do, are, are they somehow in this universe? I do not know. There are some similarities. Uh, you know, I like to say that, you know, these models in a way are like Rorschach tests. Because every person finds in these models something similar to something that they had worked on. So, for example, I gave a talk in September, Harvard. And Gabadacci told me later that these are like models of Galileo uh, that he had studied. And Kumran sent me an e or told me, and then he sent me an email saying that it reminds him of some topological field theory where the derivatives are kind of funny. And I looked up this paper, it's exactly there. And Joe McGomez told me that it reminds him of some asymptotic symmetry existing in space time, which might very well be the case. And you also raise an interesting question that the, these models of Costello. The, there's no Lorentz invariance, and some, some directions are treated differently than others, and there might be similarity. The answer is possibly. Okay. I don't think his systems are unitary, but these are unitary systems. But maybe I'm wrong, I'm not an expert. In that. I think this is the same system that Jack also studied with uh, Coron. Yeah, that, that, that's, what, that's why I asked, because those models do come from a Lorentz invariance breaking twist of a supersymmetric theory, and they embed in the topological string. So that, that's why I was asking. OK, I do not know if there are supersymmetric uh, versions of this model. I don't even know how to put Fermi. I have not put Fermi on. So I think the first one here is to study such systems with Fermi on. And then maybe there's a supersymmetric system. I predict that high energy physicists might be interested in the supersymmetric models. I will be very interested in the supersymmetric models. I predict that no condensed matter physicists 
maybe I could just just a comment about the question about the, those models, um, those holomorphic ones. They they definitely do have the sort of behavior you described of a Wilson line operator that only goes in that's sort of frozen. Um, mm -hmm. And so in that sense, they might have something like a fracton fracton okay. description. Yeah, I don't I'll know. I'll be delighted to look for something. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there is any more question, count down five seconds. But uh, first, let's thank uh, Nati for the wonderful lecture. Toda raba ika. Thank you. Zeha kavo shalalu. And thank you very much. Anna Takishu. Oh, I'm impressed Baba. by your Hebrew. Can you, can you understand it? Okay, yes, I could. Great. Anna Takishu. Thank you. It's our honor. Thank you.